You're on the observation deck. I'm Jeff Herzer, and we're talking with Larry Ang, who is principal architect with Kelly Clark Pelly, one of the world's great architecture firms in Chicago to accept the Council on Tall Buildings Lifetime Achievement Award on behalf of Caesar Pelly. Thanks for coming to see us. Um, the Patronus Towers in Malaysia, uh, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago they were completed. Uh, looking back on the Patronus Towers now, uh, how, did, how have they stood up over time? Hello everyone. Um, that's a very interesting question because our firm is currently designing two projects in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur. So we do, uh, we are going back quite often to, uh, to Kuala Lumpur over the past um, 10 to 12 years, as to, to be precise, since the towers was completed. And we have been looking at the project almost uh, on, a, on a monthly basis. Uh, and on hindsight, uh, we have to thank uh, Dr. Martir, who was really the client for the project that he has the intelligence to ask us uh, to design a building that is beautiful, that is memorable, and that's long lasting. Because in this view, that building height is a, a brief moment of glory. Sooner or later, there will be towers, taller than the Petronas Towers. What he would like us to design is uh, a, a pair of very beautiful twin towers uh, that will forever stay in people's memory and I have been looking at the project <coughs> for almost 12 years now and I'm proud to say that and I, I think in today's eyes it's still looking very beautiful, very fresh. Uh, two international finance centers and other uh, Caesar Kelly uh, really iconic landmark project that uh, occupies uh, one end of the bay in Hong Kong. Uh, another iconic building, uh, some might call a uh, typical Caesar Pelly design, which I don't know if there's any. I'm going to start this. Uh, I'm going to start the questioning. But let me let me talk some more about Patronus. What is what exactly about Patronus is so uh, so relevant ten years later that makes you keep going back? Um, <clears throat> I believe one of the most essential ingredient is is the relevance to to the culture of the place and to the context of the place. Uh, as you know, uh, Malaysia is an uh, Islamic country. Uh, it has a very deep rooted uh, cultural heritage. So uh, the generator of the farm is the rotation of the two squares, which is the most fundamental aspect of uh, 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 Islamic geometry. Uh, and, and with the transformation of the, uh, of the rotation of two squares into a totally modern form. Uh, so when people look at the tower, they can identify with uh, not only see it as a beautiful building, but also see the cultural aspect and the cultural relevance uh, that they can identify with. And, uh, and more importantly, uh, the pet people see Petronas Towers as a pair of twin towers, but very few people know that there is a huge public domain uh, that people can actually participate and enjoy in front of the Petronas Towers of 50 Acre Park, where uh, every day, every weekend, is filled with people, and the same in front of the Petronas Tower, there's a huge uh, plaza with the fountains uh, and, and trees and flowers. And, and, and between the two towers, there's a concert hall where there's a public civic function. And I think all these things are very important to the making of a, of a landmark because it's not just an object to look at. It's, it's, a, it's a place that an average citizen can participate. Uh, and I believe that is very important. It's the form, as much form as the content. Nationally, uh, a lot of people have said that uh, Malaysia, uh, the Petronas Towers really put Malaysia on the map. A lot of people in the world didn't know where Malaysia was until the Petronas Towers went up. As a as a national symbol, how much how have the people of Malaysia kind of adopted this and, and taken this tower in to be their own? Is that the case? And I think one of the most gratifying experiences for us uh, as architects is when you go back uh, to visit Malaysia, that people still come up to you to thank you for giving them a beautiful, beautiful landmark uh, that they could be proud of. And I think that is uh, and also to see how people really enjoy. Uh, uh, visiting the place, not only visitors or tourists, but the locals, 
uh, uh, going to see the, the, the building and, and to, to, to use the pump. And that is a very gratifying uh, experience. You know, the way, the way I was introduced to uh, Cesar Pelli and his work and his firm uh, was the Miglin Beitler Tower in Chicago that was proposed in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, that was actually announced, a uh, 2,000 foot tall building that was to be the tallest building in the world. Uh, they had acquired a parcel of land for it, the press releases had been issued. Uh, the first Gulf War came along and all of the financing dried up. And uh, one of the questions I've been wanting to ask Cesar Pelle for so many years is, what it must feel like when he comes to Chicago and seeing a place in the skyline where one of his buildings must stand? What's that feel like? Ah, uh, funny you ask this question. I just had a conversation with uh, Mr. Pelle this morning about this, exactly the same subject matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, we both feel that you have been a wonderful, wonderful addition uh, to the skyline of Chicago because if you look at the tall buildings in Chicago, uh, they all end uh, in a rather f a flat top way. You know, it's not uh, a, what in Caesar's field would be a traditional skyscraper uh, with a gentle tempering to, uh, that's a, a gradual transition from the ground to the, to the sky and uh, when you transform into a spire, uh, when you reach the top of the tower, uh, it does meet the sky in a very poetic manner, which other uh, Chicago skyscrapers are very good uh, tall buildings, but it's a different kind of tall building. So uh, in that sense, because the design made by the wood have been a unique design uh, in the family of tall buildings in Chicago. I think that's probably one of the most beautiful tall buildings that was ever built. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, I've heard it said before also that uh, the Miglin Beitler Tower of course, was a forerunner to uh, to International Finance Center um, in Hong Kong, which is another beautiful, tall, slender building uh, that has what I've come to associate with Caesar Pelli, a look that I've come to associate with the firm, and it kind of looks like uh, sarin and design. Uh, and of course, you're quick to point out that there is no Caesar Pelli look in particular, but how did the Miglin Beitler Tower, how does it relate to two International Finance Center? Is it really kind of the same building or no? No, yes, no, they are two very different buildings. The Midland Violet uh, is a uh, what I call uh, uh, New York skyscraper typology, where it uh, starts uh, with a larger forebay at the base, and then it uh, tapers towards the body, and then it uh, becomes smaller to the top uh, to form a very elegant profile until it transforms itself into a spire to, to reach the sky. Whereas the, um, the International Finance Center in Hong Kong uh, is, as you can see from the silhouette, uh, is very much uh, um, uh, like, a, like a pylon uh, and, and with a crowning gesture. So in terms of silhouette, it's the two different kinds of building. And, um, and of course, the, uh, one of the major considerations in the design of the International Finance Center uh, is the to International Financial Center is to uh, uh, consider the, uh, the peak uh, of Hong Kong as the backdrop because the peak uh, is still the, one of the most natural beauties in, in the world. So our charge is to how to design a tall building that complements the, uh, uh, the image of the peak and not to compete with it. Um, how to enhance the, the, the beauty of the Victoria Harbor and, um, and, and not to compromise beauty of Victoria Harbor. So uh, it's, a, it's two different kind of design problems. One of the, the great talents, I think, of, uh, of Kelly Clark Kelly is that uh, the firm has really designed landmark buildings that have to get along with other landmark buildings. And not only do they have to get along with them, but they are also uh, significantly shorter than them. They, they're kind of a transition between super tall buildings in the rest of the city, which of course is a very important function. And the example that comes to mind is uh, Cesar Pelli's work uh, next to the former World Trade Center towers. And you're kind of getting into the same thing now in Shanghai with the Pudong uh, land development project. You're next to two super tall buildings, the Shanghai World Financial Center and the Jin Mao building that uh, are well over a thousand feet tall. And uh, your firm is developing some buildings that uh, our transition from those buildings to the rest of town at about 260 meters. Um, 
what's, what is the secret to doing that well, to, to providing good transitions, and to getting along with the rest of an urban environment? Well, I think uh, in every context, there is a pre-established master plan. And, and I think uh, our firm, uh, as, a, as a practice, uh, takes the, the, the guideline, the design guideline established by the master plan uh, seriously because uh, people spend so much time uh, to establish a master plan. There are, there are strong, there are a lot of thinking, there are lots of uh, architectural consideration that goes into the foundation of the master plan. So uh, we, we usually work within the, uh, the guidelines of the master plan and see how we can come up with a, uh, a design uh, that is unique, that has just its own presence, but at the same time, uh, uh, it sit well, rather comfortably with the neighbors, as neighbors used to say, uh, a new design of building in an con urban context is like designing pieces of a city. Uh, the, 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 the piece, that, the, the addition that you put in is just as important as the totality of the whole urban skyline, the urban image, uh, the big picture is the whole world. There's no such thing as a, uh, as a small building or a project that doesn't matter, every piece is, is functional and, and matters? Uh, I do not believe height, I believe beauty uh, and the architectural appropriateness is much more important than the height. Uh, you know, we are at the moment, we are designing a building in, uh, in London which is only six meters tall, but uh, it's a very good uh, uh, urban addition uh, it's a very unique urban addition, and uh, I have no doubt when it's finished, people will talk about that building just as much as uh, they talk about the uh, one kind of the square at the Canary Wharf. What are some of the other projects going on at uh, the firm these days? Uh, we have, have a few buildings in uh, tall towers in Europe uh, that, that are uh, close to completion. Uh, one of which is the Torre Castelli in Madrid, which will be the tallest building in, in Madrid. Um, and as, as you know, the, uh, today when we are designing a tall building, there are much more, um, uh, we have other obligations other than, uh, than, than just, just designing a beautiful form, you know, and uh, the, the sustainability is, a, is an issue. And I think it's uh, one of those uh, 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 groundbreaking uh, tall buildings that, that we've designed where the entire tower uh, is utilizing uh, uh, an interactive um, uh, uh, curtain wall uh, with on four air, air intake and on four, air, four exhaust as the minimize the use of energy. Uh, it's also one of the uh, largest uh, application of low line drugs uh, in a tall building. Uh, so you know, uh, I think these are the, the new direction uh, that the firm is heading. You know, the sustainability is definitely playing a very important role in how we think about uh, a town, uh, how we think uh, about an architectural form. You're in Chicago to accept an award on behalf of Caesar Kelly, an award from the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and you've been at, uh, you've been at Kelly Clark Kelly since 1981, and, and you've spent a, a lot of time around Caesar Kelly. Uh, tell us why he is such an important figure in the world of architecture and what it has been like to spend these years with him. Well, I did have the privilege to work with Caesar uh, for such a long time. Uh, Caesar is not only a great architect, but a great teacher. And I think one of the most unique uh, attributes about Caesar is his, he really cares about um, what he designs, not only just a beautiful building, he really cares about people how people use the building, the enjoyment people derive from uh, seeing this building, from using this building, from going to his buildings. Uh, and then I think that is very, very unique. Because most architects you know, do a quick pencil sketch, and okay, that's a design. And that's not the way he approaches a problem. He really goes through the detail about what is the human experience uh, and, and, and the whole architectural and urban experience. And I think enjoy is exactly the right words because even even his projects that didn't get built, I'm still enjoying just the uh, just the vision of the Midland Viper Tower and uh, there are so many other wonderful Caesar Pelley projects around the world and 
uh, your your skyline is really not complete unless you have a pelly on the skyline, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. At the very <laughs> least, great compliment. Larry Eng is a principal with Pelly Clark Pelly and is in Chicago to accept a lifetime achievement award from the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat for uh, Caesar Pelly, one of the giants in the world of modern architecture. I'm Jeff Herzer, and you're on the observation deck. Thank you, Thank you so much.